Well, I used, when I worked at the bank, I was in charge of the marquee. One of the things we did for the marquee was put birthdays up there. We had a list of employees and um, we had a list of their birthdays. And anytime their birthday came up, we put their happy birthday, Tom Smith. And uh, so when it come time to mine, boy, I really made a spectacle out of that thing. I put, <laughs> but my name's been written on the marquee. But that won't get me to heaven. I used to have my name written on the blackboard in school. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't get me to heaven either. <laughs> the day I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, he wrote my name in the book of life. My name's in there. By the way, he, he wrote it with permanent, whatever he writes with up there. <laughs> Ink, I don't know, blood, whatever. It's permanent. And I can't, it cannot be erased. My name's written in heaven. And I hope yours is too. John chapter number 17. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. John chapter number 17. This is the Lord's prayer. It's not the prayer that he needed to pray. But it's the prayer. Well, rather, it was the prayer that he prayed for his disciples. You know, we often say the Lord's prayer is our Father which art in heaven. That, but that's not the Lord's prayer. That's the prayer that he taught his disciples how to pray. But in John chapter 17, we actually have the Lord's prayer. What Jesus prayed. And in John chapter 17, if you'll look at verse number 21, verse 21, John chapter number 17, we'll look that as our text verse. And we're going to talk about the problem of Christian unity. Why can't Christians get along? Why are so many churches out there in a small town? Why can't uh, Christians just get along? We'll look at that in just a little bit. Let's look at verse number 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Our Father, help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The problem of Christian unity. Here's a, here's a verse that's often quoted, but so often misunderstood. Well, this is the prayer of our Lord, and there's three groups of people mentioned in this verse. The first group of people are they, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they, may also, uh, that they also may be one in us. So we have they, and we have us, and then that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So we have three groups of people mentioned. We have they, he's talking about the disciples. We have us, Jesus talking about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And then he's talking about the world. Now, the Lord has unity in mind when he's praying for his disciples. In fact, the Lord has unity in mind between people. If you'll look at verse number 20, look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, have you believed on Jesus through the word of God? Well, he's praying for you. Aren't you glad that Jesus prays for you? Do you think that he has his prayers answered all the time? Well, if there's anybody I want praying for me, it's Jesus and he does. He's our intercessor. Well, go back to verse number 9. Same chapter, verse number 9. Jesus says, I pray for them. For the, his disciples he's talking about. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are mine. So, unity, the Lord has unity in mind between people, between individual believers. Now, to hold your place here. Well, I actually don't have to. Let's go to Galatians chapter number 6. Let's go to Galatians chapter number 6. We're going to look at a few scriptures, go to a few places in, this, in the scriptures. Galatians chapter number 6. If you'll look at verse number, um, verse number 10. And by the way, we will be going back to John 18. I'm sorry. Galatians, or John 17. Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Now look what he says. Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, 
I, I'm, I don't try to be, I'm not trying to be a mean guy. I'm not trying to be difficult to get along with. But we have people outside of our church that comes just about when we're ready to start church. And they'll want us to help them out. And, and they'll want, most of the time, they need some money because they have an uncle up in Gainesville that's in the hospital and they don't have any money to get to put gas in their car and to drive to Gainesville. Now the story is similar to that. And I always tell them, I say, look, we don't give money out around here. Um, I, I, said, uh, I said, you want some gas? You wait after the service. I'll take you down to the gas station and get you some gas. Oh, that, that's okay. We don't want to bother you. No, I said, no, it's no bother at all. Well, actually what they're wanting is money. Not, not everyone is like that. Not, not all of them is like that. But here's what the Bible says. Before we help the world, and we can if we want to, we're supposed to take care of God's people first. I said, look, I said, we've got people in our own church that has needs. I said, we're going to, I said, by the way, what church do you belong to? Well, I've been looking for a church. <laughs> I said, well, you found one. Why don't you stay? Well, we can't, you know what? Not everyone's like that. I know that. But most of them are. But the Bible says we are to do good to all men. But especially those in the household of faith. You say, you're being partial? No, I'm just being biblical. That's what the Bible says. It's amazing how people want to bypass the Bible and call you all kinds of names. You're not kind. You're not loving. You're racist. You're this and that. And I, 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 no, I'm just trying to be what the Bible tells me to be and do what the Bible tells me to do. You call me what you want. Are you are y'all okay out there? I'm just wondering. You got silent on me here a little bit. All right, now look. Here in, in John chapter 18. Now why does he look, why does he want the disciples to get along? Why does he want unity? Why does he want believers to get along, Christians to get along? Well, the verse here's a here's a witness here through which unity is stressed. Now here's the reason. Verse 21, last part. <clears throat> that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Does the world, does the outside, do, do people outside of our churches recognize unity among Christians? Man, I'm telling you, for the, for the most part, not for the most part, but there, there, there's, some, there's some people that are busting up churches and going to other churches and trying to bust them up. And this world stands back and looks and says, let's see those Christians. They can't even get along with each other. Now Jesus is praying for unity so that the world will take notice and believe in him. And that's the reason. So uh, disunity is part of the problem of mankind. It always has been. It's, uh, by the way, it is sin that separates God and man. Is it not? It separates man and man. It separates parents from children. It separates husbands from wives. It separates nation from nation and so forth. Even though sinners may have logic, even though sinners may have some ground to stand on when they point their finger to us and say, see those Christians can't get, get along, they, they still don't have an excuse because they can't get along with each other either. Well, not only the witness through which unity is stressed, but the way to unity is stated here. He said here in verse number 21, that they all may be one in us, he says. Now, in Galatians, let's go back to Galatians. Still hold your place here and go back to Galatians. And if you look at chapter number 3, Galatians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians, here we go. Galatians chapter number 3. If you'll look at verse number 28. Galatians 3 verse number 28. The Bible says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, outside of Christ Jesus, there is no unity. 
It's only inside of Christ Jesus. Now, two things about real Christian unity. Number one, it's based on the common life, his life. If there's any unity between Christians, it has to be based on Jesus. It can't be based on anything else. It's his life. It's the common life. Common life, which is his life. And then it's, ex it's expressed in a pattern of Christian love. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. Man, look, there's many people, they talk about love and they talk about fellowship, but they have no concept of the new birth at all. Without the new birth, there cannot be any central love there. If Jesus is not the central figure, then there can't be no unity. I can't be, look, look, <clears throat> I can't be unified with you without Jesus. Because sooner or later, knowing, <laughs> knowing uh, human nature, there's going to something be crop, cropping up. <laughs> there's something we're going to disagree with. But I'm going to tell you, when you place Jesus right in, in, the, in between believer and believer, we can have unity. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. But we have the prayer of our Lord. The prayer is that they may be one as we are. And then not only is the prayer of the Lord, but there's going to be problems that, that comes in the way. Problems in the way. Well, what kind of problems do Christians have? So, <laughs> Y'all got time for this? <laughs> so I'm just telling you, there's a lot of problems that Christians, why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many churches in one little town? And why can't they get along? Well, there's two things. There's two things. Number one, there's the problem of tastes and temperaments and traditions. Now, not every church likes the same thing. Not every Christian likes the same thing. Some churches have traditions that other churches don't have. Some churches have, and we all have different temperaments, don't we? We, we don't think alike. Not, we, we don't all think alike. We don't all act alike. We have different choices or different tastes, different temperaments, uh, different um, traditions. And they show up in the methods of worship. First of all, now, there are some churches that will stand and sing all ten verses of the hymn. Turn to page 252. Let's sing all ten stanzas. Now some churches will do that. I'm not one of those kind of guys. Look, look <clears throat> let me just say that. But that's okay. If that's what they want to do, that's fine. We should still be able to get along. There's some churches that don't stand when they sing. They just sit down. There's some churches that stand when they pray. There's some churches that do both. They stand, they sit down. They're just different traditions of churches. We used to, in, in Red Star Missionary Baptist Church, <clears throat> we would take up the offering. We had ushers, and we took up the offering. And at the end of the offering, this lady with a real squeaky voice who led the songs, <laughs> she would get up and she said, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> oh, we do that every time. Now you say, what, what was wrong with that? Nothing. If that's what you wanted to do, that's fine. But I'm, I'm saying here, there's, there's people who visit a church and they'll say, well, I just don't like, I just don't like their music. Well, that's fine. You know, you're going to have different tastes. You're going to have different temperaments. Can I tell you what kind of songs that God wants in the church? Y'all ready? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Now, let me show you in the Bible. <laughs> let me show you here. You say, I just, I like Southern Baptist music. Well, I do too. I like, I like that hillbilly. Oh, I do too. I don't like opera. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's just me though. 
Look, we can still get, if you like opera, I can still get along with you. If you don't like hillbilly, you can still get along with me. Right. We're talk, look, we're talking about unity here. Right? Let's go to uh, Galatians and then Colossians. Galatians and Colossians. We've been in Galatians a couple times, but let's go there again. Oh, I'm sorry, Ephesians, not Galatians, Ephesians and Colossians. I'll show you what kind of songs we are, <coughs> that we need to sing. You say, preacher, what's wrong with the ones we sing now? Nothing, nothing wrong with what we sing now. But I'm just showing you, for the sake of argument, some people say, well, we, we like that contemporary stuff. Well, you can have that. I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want it here either, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, Ephesians 5, verse number 19. What kind of music that you ought to have? Well, in verse number 19, now he's not talking about speaking to you. He's not talking about talking to yourself. You know, he's speaking to yourselves, plural. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and Spiritual songs. Now look at the rest of that verse. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now you can sing out loud, and I hope you do, and you do. Or you can sing inside, inside your heart. Sing, and you're doing that to the Lord. But you know what Psalms is? A, a psalm is a song by definition, by Webster's definition. A, a psalm is a song composed on a divine subject and in praise to God. That's what a psalm is. We got a bunch of them in our Bible, don't we? Psalms. And there's some churches that sing the psalms. There's nothing wrong with that. Is there? Nothing wrong. Because God said that's why you, you can do that. Psalms. And then he says, what's the next one? And he says hymns. By the way, <clears throat> do you know the word hymns is not even in the Old Testament? It's in the New Testament. In fact, after Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, after they had the Lord's Supper, you know what they did? Twice is in the Gospels. In Matthew and Mark, they went out and sung a what? They went out and sung a hymn. Now, what's a hymn? <laughs> you heard about the widow woman that uh, talked about, they were talking about him. She said, I'll take him and him and him. And so, anyway. Here's what a hymn is. A hymn is a short poem composed for religious services or a song of joy and praise to God. Now that sounds pretty good, don't it? So the Bible says we can sing psalms and we can sing hymns. And what else? And spiritual songs. Now what spiritual songs is? Well, spiritual songs is, number one, consisting of spirit. But the Bible says, try the spirits, whether they be of God. But it means pertaining to divine things. So we can sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I believe that's, that's specifically what God says we can do. Now, I like the old rugged cross. I believe that's a good hymn. I, I like how firm a foundation. That's a good spiritual song. Some of this other stuff is coming around. I mean, it doesn't have any message. It doesn't exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're safe, listen to me, we're safe in singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, we're getting back to the problems in our way of Christian, uh, Christian unity. The problems of taste, temperaments, and so forth. Now, sometimes it shows up in the methods of church government. That is the way that churches are conducted or churches are run. And first of all, Jesus is the head of the church, right? Jesus, there are some colleges, there are some books and literature that tells you, that will instruct you that the pastor is untouchable. That's not Bible. He's got the answer to Jesus. And, and by the way, if I read my Bible correctly, he's got to answer to some deacons. Now, they're not to tell him what to preach. But my friends, listen, you get a young pastor in a church and he's going off the deep, the, the deep end. Somebody's got to call him down. And it has to be those deacons. Y'all look at me like I'm crazy. 
But if you look at the qualifications of a deacon, and, and by the way, there's qualifications. Look, do you know that in the Bible, there are elders, there are bishops, there are pastors, there are teachers, there are evangelists? Now, you say, preacher, y'all don't have any elders, but... We, you say, preacher, as a Baptist church, you better not have any elders because that belongs to the Mormon people. No, it's in the Bible. We've got some elders in here. You just don't want to admit your age. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. There's nothing wrong with that. And you know what a bishop was? A bishop was an overseer. And so you've got to have somebody... That will keep that pastor, that young pastor in check because, man, he comes fresh out of college. He may have some ideas that are not in this Bible. And if he starts tearing the church up, somebody's got to call him down. You say, but he's untouchable. Show me a verse on that. He's not untouchable. Well, let's go on. Methods of government. Uh, I want you to think about there are some enrichment, enrichment through a variety of forms and procedures in the church. Um, there's, there's some churches that have church first and then they have Sunday school. There's nothing wrong with that. Brother Knox has his services on Thursday, or his midweek service on Thursday. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to have a service on Monday, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to have it on Saturday, that's nothing wrong with that. But we certainly need to have it on the Lord's Day, first day of the week. So here's what I'm saying. There's, there's a lot of things that we don't do like other churches do that might be an enrichment to us. I'm not talking about compromise or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. But there can be diversity without causing deep divisions in the Christian life. By the way, just think, how, just think about how dull all flower gardens would be if you just had roses. You got a variety of stuff, don't you? Now, I've always wanted to do this. I just hadn't, I just hadn't gotten the courage to do it yet. I've always wanted to go to an independent Baptist church or, or pastor's fellowship and wear a priest collar. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that and just get, just get stared down. I, I guarantee you they'll be looking at me. Preacher Bloxton, what, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? Well, why, why are you wearing that? I said, why are you wearing that tie? So, I mean, I'm just telling you, I know you say, well, it, identif it identifies with the Episcopalians or the Catholics or what. Oh, we're not talking about that. I'm just telling you that there's a lot of things that causes disunity that doesn't, make, that doesn't matter to a hill of beans. Well, we don't have pews in our church. We got chairs. Well, fine. Sit on wooden benches if you want. Sit on a stool if you want. It doesn't, it doesn't make, we're not talking about that. We're, we're talking about being unified in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. So there are tastes, there are traditions, there are temperaments that, that if you're not careful, it can cause disunity and it shouldn't. It shouldn't cause disunity. Now, I've got convictions, so do you. I've got preferences, so do you. My preferences are that when you stand behind this pulpit, you look like a preacher. Or song leader, whatever. Now, I realize there are some exceptions. Ryan just gets in from work sometimes, and he's a welder and all. But, and, and I have never once told him, you, you're, you're just too dirty to get up here. He's showing, look, look, he's showing that he wants to be in church, and he tries to get here on time. Sometimes he can't get here without, I mean, can't get changed out or anything like that. I said, man, I, I'm not looking at your clothes. I'm looking at your heart. Now, let me, let me just say this. You, you ought to look your best for Jesus if you possibly can. And uh, I'm all for that. Well, there can be also disagreements in methods of church, uh, of, of church government. 
Now we have pastor, we have deacons, we have trustees and so forth. Not every church has all that, but the Bible speaks of elders and bishops and, and pastors and deacons and so forth. But the, there's problems in the church. Sometimes there's problems of taste, tradition, and temperament. But the real problem is the problem of truth. Now that can be a real problem. If you don't have truth, you can't have unity. You cannot have unity if you don't have the truth. You can have unity if your tastes are different, if your temperament is different, and so forth. But you cer certainly can't. Uh, what am I saying? Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians. We're in Ephesians. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Look at verse 14. Chapter 6, verse number 14. Now, notice what he says. You know this. You know this. It says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Now, how does one obtain forgiveness of sin? There's only one answer. You can't get forgiveness by being baptized. You can't get forgiveness by joining a church. You get forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so there's only one answer. Now, not every church has that one answer. And if you don't have that one answer, I can't have unity with you. Can't. There's, there's a problem of truth there. Well, let me ask you this question. Where does a believer's soul go after death? There's only one answer. He goes to heaven. He doesn't go to purgatory. He doesn't, he doesn't go in the grave and wait there. He goes to, to depart and be with the Lord, which is what? Far better. To be absent from the body and to be what? Present, Present with the Lord. There's only one answer. When these, when these bozos say you soul sleep and you... No, no. No, I can't get along with that. It's not the truth. So why would you want to yoke up with somebody... That teaches and preaches false doctrine. You can't do it. You can't do it. I, I get so sick and tired. Of hearing people say. Well you need to respect his religion. His religion sending you to hell. I'm not going to respect that. I'm not going to put up with that. I'm not going to unify with somebody. That teaches and preaches that. Call me nasty. Call me mean. Call me belligerent, call me whatever you want. But I'm going to be on Jesus' side, not on their side. Well, think about this. There's only one answer to this. Is the Bible God's word? <laughs> There's only one answer. Listen, both sides cannot be true. You're either saved by grace, or you're not saved at all. Well, the prayer of our Lord, he said that they may be one. The problems that's in our way. Sometimes it's taste, sometimes it's temperance, or temperaments it shouldn't be. But you better have the truth. And if you don't have the truth, you're in trouble. But then the prospects in our time. Now, I don't hear so much about it now, probably because I don't run in their circles. But what about the ecumenical movement? Let's just have a countywide meeting. Let's get all of the churches together and let's all get all of the religions together and let's just all be one. Some people claim that it's a movement of the Holy Spirit, but it is not. Remember, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth, right? He's called the Spirit of Truth. He's not called the Spirit of Error, and we must try the spirits whether they be of God. Now, I, I used to get calls like that. Preacher, why don't you join us in this fellowship and that fellowship? We're going to meet at su such and such a church. And I said, well, who's coming? Well, we've got the pastor this and we've got the pastor that. And we got. I said, what do we have in common? Well, we all love Jesus. Oh, okay. Well, what about some doctrine? Give me some, what, what do you believe? Do you believe you can lose your salvation? Well, some of them do. I said, I can't fellowship with that. But we all don't, but we all are not for abortion. We're not for abortion. Well, I'm not either. 
But that's not why we ought to get together. We ought to get together because of the word of God. So there's some people I can, look, I can fellowship with some people that believe you can lose your salvation and so forth. I, I can fellowship with some of those. But when you deny the virgin birth, when you deny the deity of Christ, when you divide, d deny the, uh, the inerrancy of the scriptures, I can't get along. I can't, I can't fellowship with you. Sorry not being a bad guy. But I'd rather have fellowship with Jesus than fellowship with false doctrine, wouldn't you? Amen. Well, let me give you two things here. We'll close. There's the danger in this ecumenical movement. The danger in the situation. Galatians chapter 1. And let me turn there. We're in 2 Corinthians. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1, verse number 6. No, verse number 9. Verse number 9. Galatians 1 and 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Do you know that the number of Bible-believing churches are declining? Do you know they're getting fewer and fewer and far between? Do you know that they're causing and, and, and causing those same churches to compromise truth to get a crowd? They'll look at something and they'll say, Man, our people's going to other churches. We, we've got to kind of let up on our doctrine a little bit to get them back. We kind of get, no, you don't either. You won't have a church if you let up on your doctrine. I'm glad Noah didn't let up on his doctrine. Amen. You say, well, boy, Noah didn't have any, anybody really. Noah didn't have too many people. You're doing pretty good if you get your entire family in. But Noah, after he got in that boat and God shut him in, <laughs> they were the majority. And we may not be the majority now, but I'm going to tell you, when the rapture takes place, everybody that knows Jesus is going up. Amen. And this world's going to be left behind. I'd rather be on the uptake than the downstay. Amen? Well, one more thing here. The duty before the Christian. Not only the danger in the situation, this ecumenical movement. Look, look, by the way, when a person, when a guy gets up there and says, I'm going to sprinkle this little baby and this little baby will go to heaven because I sprinkled him. That's not Bible. That little baby has no idea what's going on. When a, when a young person, boy or girl, comes to the age of accountability, when they realize, I know that I do wrong, and I know that I'm a sinner, I need Jesus. That's when, that's when you grab a hold of them. That's when you tell them about the Lord. That's when they need to get saved. And then that's when they need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. But you sprinkle little babies, that, not, that doesn't get them to heaven. Well, preacher, I wouldn't say that. I'm saying that because the Bible doesn't back that up. You either got to tell what the Bible says or you're going to believe some person that's going to run his own deal. I'm going to try, I'm going to get along with Jesus because I believe his book. You, do you? Well, the duty. There's got to be humility demonstrated in unimportant matters. <laughs> unimportant matters. There's some things that come up in a church, in every church, that are really unimportant as far as unity goes. Well, preacher, I'm just... I don't like the color of these pews. Well, are you comfortable? Well, yeah, they're comfortable. I just don't like the color. Well, are you going to leave church because you don't like the color of the pews? <laughs> You'd be surprised. That's not unit. That's unimportant. That really is unimportant. You ought to thank God we've got a roof over our head. You ought to thank God we've got lights. You ought to thank God we've got air conditioning. I'm just telling you, not everybody's going to, there are just some things that are unimportant. And it doesn't really matter a whole lot as far as Christian unity is concerned. Have you ever said this about somebody that, that's a believer? Have you ever said this? I can't believe they bought that color of a car. That's the ugliest color I've ever seen in my life. What in the world are they driving something like that for? Well, maybe because they like it. Right? 
Well, my, my, did you see that dress she had on? That's the ugliest thing. That old thing. That old thing just, look at it. Look, 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 look. <laughs> well, maybe she likes that color dress. Maybe she likes that. Did you see her hairdo? <laughs> Can't believe that happens. <laughs> Man, we're talking about Christian. That's not important. That's not important. Now, you can make a big deal out of it if you want, but I don't think Jesus makes a big deal out of it. I know he talks about certain things and everything, but, but if you're not careful, we'll be starting another church somewhere. <laughs> well, last thing. Let's go to 2 Timothy. There's got to be humility in unimportant matters. Humility in unimportant matters. But there must be a rigidity when it comes to the truth. I mean, you've got to stand on the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. All right, chapter 1. 2 Timothy 1, verse number 13. 2 Timothy 1, verse number 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and what, church? And love which is in Christ Jesus. Do not compromise, he says. Do not budge one inch when it comes to truth. Because truth is the most important matter in a church. You can fill up a church without truth. Do you know that? A lot of it's being done. There's a pretty boy out in Texas that's done it. Out in Houston. <laughs> you don't hear much preaching. You hear a lot of stuff. You hear a lot of philosophy. You don't hear a whole lot of preaching. When's the last time you heard him preach on sin? When's the last time you heard? By the way, have you ever heard him preach on hell? Never. I'm going to tell you, you got to stand on the truth. On things that are not really important, it's a different story. But you've got to stand on the truth. Now, next week, we're going to look at two studies on this. The problem, remember, we're doing, the series is, what is your problem? Now, next week, we're going to start on the problem of alcohol. Does America have a problem with alcohol? Do, our, do some churches have a problem with alcohol? It's a problem. We're going to take two studies on that. The problem of alcohol. But... As we think about unity, remember who the unifier is. The unifier is Jesus Christ. And, and where, where something is not spelled out in the Bible, let's just, let's just look to him for that. Amen? Amen? Just go to him for that. So let's remember this. We, the reason that our churches a lot of times are not growing is because we can't get along with each other. We got to learn how to get along. Amen. Father, tonight we ask you that you'll help us to remember that your son Jesus prayed for his disciples that they may be one as you and your father was. And we ask your God tonight that you'll help us as Christians to love one another, to cherish one another, to look out for one another, to help one another. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We may have different tastes and different temperaments. We may have been used to different traditions. But Father, just help us to realize that you went to a cross and died for us. The way we were, the way we acted, the way we thought, the way we did things, Father, thank you for going to a cross and shedding your blood. I pray, Heavenly Father, tonight, if there's one here that needs to be saved, that you would save him. We ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name for his sake. Amen. Amen.